Nice to see everybody this evening. We have a few announcements to make. We want to keep in our prayers. Uh, Michelle Moore, Dante's mother, uh, she passed away yesterday afternoon. And so if you didn't see the report on that, I uh, want to keep them in our prayers. Uh, it's good to see Dan back there. He's waving, so hope he continues to improve. Any other sick or anybody updates? Okay, a lot of things going on. Upcoming activities. The men's breakfast this Saturday morning at 8.30 out at the Bonnie Cafe at the airport. So look forward to being there for that. Ladies, there's a bridal shower uh, luncheon for Ellie Young. I only really want to say Ellie Parks. That's just, it's all, it's, I'm already practicing. But for Ellie, I said, who's Ellie Young? Uh, Ellie, she uh, will have that May 15th here at noon. And there's a sign-up sheet on Deanne's door for that. The Overstreets are hosting the kids group Sunday, May 22nd, after evening services. So uh, keep that in mind as well, May 22nd, after evening services. Tuesday school graduation went very well last night. We had 108 uh, folks from the community and family members and some from this congregation there. And uh, it was a good, good evening. It didn't go as planned, so everything went well. It was uh, the kids, uh, some of them that didn't want to participate in the morning participated at night. The ones that didn't particip did participate in the morning didn't want to participate at night, so it was, it was a good, good, uh, good night, and we really do appreciate and ask you to continue to support this program as we go forward. Any other announcements? One of the most uh, important themes of the book of Ezekiel, and that's where we're at tonight for our devotion. One of the most important themes of the book is that of personal responsibility. Uh, the nation of Israel is in captivity because of their actions and their rebellion. And God told them and gave them this warning back in Leviticus. 
If you do not obey me and do not observe all these commandments, and if you despise my statutes, or if, you, if your soul abhors my judgments, so that you do not perform all my commandments, but break my covenant, also will, uh, I will also do this to you. I will even appoint terror over you, wasting disease and fever, which shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of the heart. And you, you're, uh, you shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. And that's what Israel finds themselves in, in this condition of not able to take care of themselves and not even able to have their own land. Ezekiel's an interesting prophet. There's two primary prophets during the captivity, Ezekiel and Daniel. Daniel's working in the palace, and Ezekiel's working out in the country. And so God has his men in both places where the Jews are, in the country and in the city. And while Daniel is working toward the national restoring of Israel, them going back to uh, Jerusalem, which at the end of seven years he will bring up, Ezekiel works on the spiritual restoration. And so in Ezekiel 36 and verse 26, God says to the people through the prophet, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. It's a wonderful statement. And the whole chapter and the whole context, uh, you should go read Ezekiel 36 because the whole context deals with this idea of restoration, that I'm going to bring you back to where you need to be spiritually. And there's a couple of considerations about this verse that I just want to mention briefly this evening, that he would give them a, a new heart and a new spirit. He'd give them a new, new frame of mind. He'd give them a, a new uh, way to think, he, a mind that would be changed from carnal to spiritual. You see, it was carnality that led them into captivity. It would be spirituality that would lead them out. And the same is true for Christians today. In Acts chapter 2, and verse 38, when the people were asked, what must we do to be saved? The first thing they were told to do was what? Repent. Change the way you think. Change your mind. Change your actions. The Lord in Revelation 3, verse 19, told the lukewarm church at Laodicea that they need to be very zealous and repent. The perspective of life cannot be focused on the material. It can't be focused on the self. It needs to be on God and the spiritual. And so God says, I'm going to give you a new heart, a new way to think about things, a new mind, a new spirit. The heart that uh, God would give them would not be made like the tables of stone. We remember way back in Jeremiah 31, when we talked about him a couple weeks ago, that passage that I will put, make a new covenant with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their minds, write it in their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. And this exactly is what God did. He gave them a new law to lead them in paths of righteousness, to pursue faith and righteousness and love and peace out of a pure heart. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and verse 22. He says, I'll take your heart of stone out of you. It's interesting. When you think about stone, it's senseless. It's unfeeling. There's no life to it. He says, I'll put within you a heart of flesh. Our Lord wants the same for us today. You see, people have grown dull in heart. There are ears they can barely hear. Their eyes they've closed, lest they should see with their eyes. Hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them, Matthew 13 and verse 15. God would give them a heart of flesh, not the fact that all these people didn't have that organ that pumps blood through their body and he had to, he had to give it to them. But what he's saying is, I'm going to give you a body that, and a heart that has the ability to feel again, that you can feel guilt and sorrow, and loss, and love, and compassion, because Israel didn't feel that. They didn't have that for such a long time. Paul describes people today that have no capacity to feel those things. He says, the Spirit speaks expressly that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth, 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 3. And so that heart that's able to feel is what God wanted his people to have and still wants us to have today. When I read this verse in Ezekiel, it reminded me of something else. In Psalm 51, verse 10, when David made the request after he had sinned, Create me a clean heart, O God. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. And this is the objective God has for all people. To create in us clean hearts, clean minds, good emotions, if we let him. There's one commentator that I found that said something about this verse, and it, it was quite interesting. He said, that is, uh, 
another temper, hearkening to God's laws, trembling at his threats, molded into a compliance with his whole will, to forbear, to do, to be, or suffer whatever God will, receiving the impression of God as soft wax receives, receives the impression of the seal. That's the way our hearts need to be, ready to receive the impression of God in our lives. And so tonight we have a song of encouragement if you've not obeyed the gospel of Christ. Is your, so, your heart soft? Is it able to feel these things, the, the guilt, uh, the pain of, of sin? Then allow God to put his impression on your heart. Tonight, repent of your sins. Confess Jesus as Lord. Be baptized for the remission of your sins. As children of God, sometimes we put our, in that heart of stone for ourselves and we rebel against God. Well, he's willing to forgive us if we come to him. So if you need the prayers of the church on your behalf tonight, we invite you to come take the front seat as we stand saying the song of encouragement. Please be seated. Teachers are now dismissed to prepare for their classes while we sing number 882, No Tears in Heaven. 882, we will sing first and last verses. No tears in heaven, no sorrows given, all will be glory in that land. Sorrow and pain will all have flown. No tears, no tears, no tears up there. No tears in heaven will be known. 
some morning yonder will cease to ponder o'er things this life has brought to view. All will be clearer, save ones be dearer, in heaven where all will be made new. No tears, no tears, no tears up there, sorrow No tears in heaven will be known. Let's pray. Our merciful Father in heaven, we come before you at the close of this day, so thankful for this time we have left to end this day to study from your word. Thankful we have this uh, book that can guide us, and we pray, Father, as we go into our classes, you'll give us the wisdom for the things we learn to apply to our lives. We pray that you continue to be with those of our number who are sick and uh, shut in. We ask your care be upon them. We ask that you be with uh, Dante Moore and his family at the passing of his mother. We ask that you would comfort them and use us in any way possible to help bear their burden. We ask you go with us through this hour and the rest of our lives on this earth. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good evening again. Again, we are uh, in our series on uh, grief and emotional issues and uh, turning them those things into things that are beneficial, but also being able to help us overcome some of the issues that we face. Uh, again, as some of the issues that we face. Uh, again, as we want to say uh, at the outset of each class, as I want to say. If there's uh, some issue that you need medical attention with, uh, please get it. Uh, it's not a shameful thing to ask for help. And uh, as Christians, we want to encourage one another and help one another. But there are some things that we can talk about and some things we can deal with that have a little bit of a biblical aid to help us through. And we can begin to understand maybe some things uh, as, we, as we go through this. Our lesson tonight is on fearful, or being fearful, and fear can be beneficial at times. Uh, really, it can. Uh, it, it, it helps us in our safety. It can help us in our survival uh, when we are faced with a fight-or-flight response, and that's really what happens with fear. It starts in the brain, and it moves itself through the body. You're going to make a decision uh, whether or not I'm going to run, I'm going to fight, uh, or as in the case of uh, some situations, we may become paralyzed and, and we don't know what to do. So uh, it is, again, one of those natural responses. I think it's a natural emotion. All these things we've talked about so far are natural emotions. We all feel it. We all experience it, and maybe to a greater degree than others. Uh, I'm, I just want you to know, um, before we get into this class, I'm going to be all over the place tonight with these notes. Uh, I've got so many different ways to, to deal with this subject and different aspects of fear and what comes up. And, and you may have some things that you want to add to it as well. So don't expect to get from point A to point B in a very nice, straight, neat line. It's going to take its, weave its way up and down as we get, get there tonight. Because uh, one thing I do want to start off talking about a little bit is about phobias. And because when we think about being fearful or being afraid, the first thing that comes to my mind are phobias, which is there anybody that doesn't have a phobia, a fear of something? Fear of telling the truth? No, no, <laughs> that was, <laughs> think about that one for a minute. Uh, we all have some. Um, what are some of the most common uh, phobias? Spiders, public speaking. Heights, water, claustrophobia. Uh, I had a list that I was going to put up there. You probably couldn't have read it. There were so many phobias. Uh, there's, there's a phobia for everything. 
Uh, and um, clowns, anybody afraid of clowns? That's, that's interesting to me. I, I, uh, certain clowns, maybe, <laughs> but uh, uh, clowns, storms, um, all kinds of things, um, spiders, mice, insects, uh, needles, phobia of needles. There's, there's a lot of these, and uh, it could be the result of negative experiences that we've had. Uh, I am afraid of, uh, I'm not really afraid of heights. I'm not afraid of climbing. I'm afraid of gravity. Uh, it, it's, it's the falling part. I can climb up, but getting down is, and, and I'll go into more of that here in a little bit. I don't like insects. I don't like mice. I can pick up a dead mouse out of a trap. I can't pick up a live mouse. Uh, it's kind of a strange thing. I don't like the dark. Um, I don't like being in a, a place that is completely dark. And I tell you those things because I trust you all. Uh, a lot of times when we tell people our fears, what do they do with them? They use them. So next time I get up Sunday morning, there's going to be a fake mouse up on the pulpit, right? Uh, you know, we're, yeah, sometimes that's, and that's why we don't want to tell anybody what we're afraid of or that we have any fears because we become like children and we want to tease each other with it when in fact uh, it is something that is, is quite uh, emotional and, and can be quite uh, harmful at times. Having those phobias, and we talk about those things, that's really not what we're getting into tonight because we all have that. And, and we'll, 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 we will, in a kind of roundabout way, come back to why we have some of those fears. But everybody has them, so it's a natural thing for us to feel that. But understand, phobias can lead to bigger issues. It can lead for anything from social isolation to suicide. I mean, it, it, it can run the gamut of all kinds of, of issues. And so uh, you don't want your phobias to control you. And, and if there's medical attention that you need for that, uh, please, you know, we, we want to seek that out. But uh, generally speaking, uh, we can control a lot of the phobias that we have by avoiding the situations. Uh, sometimes we just can't, but, but we have to. Uh, I, I, I thought of a question that... Um, well, two questions, in fact. I want to see how you answer these. Does, does Jesus understand our fears? Does he understand what we're going through? How? Was he afraid? Was our Lord ever afraid? That's my second question. Well, well when he was in the boat in the storm, where was he? He wasn't afraid. When he was walking on water? Huh? He was sleeping. When he walked on the water, he wasn't afraid. When he to speak to people, he wasn't afraid. When they picked up stones to kill him, he wasn't afraid. Was he afraid? I think there's anxiety there. I, I agree. I think there, there, at some point growing up, at some point uh, in his adult life, at the crucifixion, there were times where he may have had a fear. Uh, does that make him... So here's the question, does that make him flawed? No. And if our Lord could, knows how we feel, it must be because he experienced it as well. Maybe not to the extent that we're going to talk about tonight, but there were moments of anxiety. There were moments of worry. There were moments of fear. Um, even though he knew what the plan was, he's still human. And he still understood, half, you know, he's part divine and part human, fully divine, fully human, let's put it that way. Uh, and he understands what we go through. And so it's not wrong for us to have a fear um, or to experience it. And so just keep that in mind as we go through this. It's when fear starts to interfere with your life. It's when it begins to uh, affect the way that you live your life. It has the ability to paralyze a person. Uh, this isn't my uh, definition of it, but I thought I took a couple things that I found and put them together. It has the ability to paralyze a person. It causes shortness of breath, smothering sensations, dizziness, unsteady feelings, faintness, palpitations, trembling, shaking, sweating, choking, nausea, depersonalization, numbness, chills, chest pain, fear of dying, fear of going crazy, or fear of doing something uncontrolled. I understand some of these. My fear of heights, as I said, I can climb up the ladder, I can get on my roof, I can blow all the stuff off the top of my roof. Getting down... Christina will look at me and say, why are you so sweaty? Because I had to climb down the ladder. 
It makes me, it makes me sweat. My knees shake. I feel weak. Um, doing something uncontrolled. I'll come back to that here in a minute as well. Uh, and, and my fear of heights. Uh, we'll talk about that. So you've probably experienced some of these things with your fears. However, when it begins to control you, when it controls your life, that you won't do anything because of how you feel, that's where we need to uh, start to dig in and maybe how can we enjoy life without such an extent of being afraid and being able to go on uh, with, our, with our lives. Before, though, we get into a lot more of this, I just want to highlight what biblical fear is. Again, this is, we're going from point A to B. We're taking a different road here now for a second. In the fear of the Lord, there is strong confidence, and His children will have a place of refuge. The fear of the Lord is the fountain of life, to turn one away from the snares of death. What does the word fear mean in that passage? Respect, reverence, awe, okay. It's the same thing that's in other passages. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is man's all. Acts chapter 10 and verse 35. And every nation who, whoever fears Him and works righteousness is accepted by Him. This is the reverence and the respect that we oftentimes talk about. There are times when you need to fear God in this sense that you respect Him for who He is, the Creator of the universe, that should give you some pause for a moment and say, here's the Creator of the universe. I need to live my life in such a way that I reverence Him and fear Him and respect Him so that it affects how I live my life. I recognize that He's the Creator. I recognize that He has all power. I recognize that in one moment He said, let there be light, and there was light. And so I have that respect. And with that respect... I'm not going to panic at the thought of God. I'm going to respect and reverence and be in awe of that, of, that, of that God. And so in that sense, we are told to fear. But then there's other passages in the Bible where we're told not to fear. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which we accomplish for you uh, today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. And Luke chapter 12, verse 32, Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. 1 Peter chapter 3, 13 and 14, Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for, for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. And 1 John chapter 4, and verse 18, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. Whoever fears has not been perfected in love. So the first three verses tell us you've got to fear. The next four verses say don't fear. There's a man who wrote a book a long time ago, a philosophy individual. And the whole basis of his uh, argument for the non-existence of God was on this idea. That there are passages in the Bible that say you need to fear and then turn around and say you don't need to fear. And if, if one passage says you need to have fear and be afraid, and another passage says you don't need to be afraid, it's a contradiction. And if it's a contradiction, then obviously it's not true. There is no God, there is no Bible, there is no Jesus, and therefore we are creative beings for our own minds. So what is the difference between these four verses and the last three verses? Other than that it says, be afraid. No, not here. Ann? Yes. And that would be under the reverential respect and awe and and, but what about these fears? We don't need to fear for our lives. We, we need to respect Him and be fearful of Him in that sense. But here it's used in that terror sense. Don't be afraid, as Moses said, to the people. 
Pharaoh's pushing against them. The Red Sea's in front of them. Don't be afraid. Well, why wouldn't they be afraid? They're either going to drown or they're going to die at the hands of Pharaoh, right? But see, here's where God says, you don't need to worry about your life. I'm going to take care of the situation. In all these passages, uh, especially 1 Peter chapter 3 for the Christian, uh, have no fear of them nor be troubled. We don't need to fear what man can do to us, right? So, so we need to understand that there's a sense in which we respect God and reverence Him, and that's how that fear is used. But here it's used in a way to describe terror of other things or other people, okay? So uh, we need to approach God and not be afraid of Him as though He's some sort of monster hiding under the bed, but also at the same time He needs to be respected, loved, and obeyed. And so that's the biblical definition of how fear is used. And the, the reason I want to bring up that up is because that is an argument people will use to say, well, there is no God. Uh, because it's a contradiction. So we understand what biblical fear is. Now let's get into the subject of being fearful and what causes uh, excessive fear. I've got four things. Yes, four things. And there may be more. There may be something that you come up with or an idea that you have or a thought that you have that maybe causes you to be fearful. But these are generally categorized, uh, fear is categorized in one of these uh, areas. We become fearful when we do what's wrong. Go back to Genesis 3 for a minute. In Genesis 3, you know the story. Adam and Eve have sinned. Adam's e or Eve's eaten of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. She gave it to her husband, and he ate of it. Their eyes were open. They saw they were naked. They hid themselves. And in Genesis chapter 3, in verse 10, God has asked Adam the question, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. That afraid is the terror afraid. That's not, well, God, I, I have such great respect and reverence for you, I hid myself. You, you see the context of it. They knew they had done something wrong. And there are times when we do something wrong, and it causes us to be afraid. Uh, the same word is used over another passage in Genesis. It's in Genesis um, 18. In Genesis 18, Abraham and Sarah have been told that they're going to have a child. And in verse 12, of course, they're old and they're well past the age of childbearing age. And in verse 12, Sarah, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I've grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, uh, my Lord also being old? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh? saying, Surely I shall bear a child since I am old. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time I will return to you according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it and said, I did not laugh, for she was what? She was afraid. So she knew, you know, I think we would all laugh if I'm in my 90s. Somebody said, you and Christine are going to have a child this time next year. It might be, <laughs> okay. Yeah, but her laugh was a lack of trust type of laugh. And so she didn't trust God. She laughed. God caught her on it. And she said, I didn't laugh. And she said that. She, she lied because she was afraid. It's the same word that's used in Genesis 3 and verse 10. I was afraid. I was terrified of what would happen if you acknowledge or if I acknowledge I laughed. I was thinking today, I saw the neighbors. We were eating supper. And the neighbors have a truck. And they, they pulled up to their house, and uh, the dad got out, and the daughter got out on the other side. And I don't know why, but I was sitting there watching that, and I thought, you know, when I was her age, when dad picked me up from events, like practices and things, and brought me home, I didn't immediately get out of the truck. I had to explain something that I had done a day or two before. And, and I thought about this, this verse, and you know, I thought, how nice it must have been to be that age and be able to just jump out of the truck, not have to sit there and listen to a lecture for, for an hour. But he did that quite regularly, and I probably deserved it. But I remember him asking me questions. Why? Why did you do that? Why did you say that? Why did you act that way? I don't know. Why, why wouldn't I tell him? I was afraid. I was afraid. And, and so when we do things that are wrong, it can cause us to be afraid. That's a probably a good fear. 
in the sense you know that you've done something wrong and you're afraid of the consequences of it. And so it may keep you from doing it again. It may keep you from acting out. It may keep you from uh, engaging in that activity or a different activity because you know that there is something to worry about. We may be conditioned, taught, or maybe something that we experience as to why we are afraid. I want to tell you why I'm afraid of heights, or in particular, gravity. Heights, not a bad thing. Gravity and falling in particular. I was a senior in high school, and the homecoming parade for uh, football players, we all got in the back of a truck and we rode in the parade in the back of a pickup truck. It happened to be the pickup truck of our quarterback. And so we were all sitting in the back of this truck and waiting for the parade to start, and I was standing up near the tailgate. And about that time, he hit the gas. And I bent over the tailgate at my knees and grabbed a hold with my hands, and I'm hanging off the back of that tailgate. In that moment, I'd never been afraid of falling, but in that moment, I had to make a decision. Do I let go, because I'm going to hit this concrete hard, or do I fight and pull myself back up? I pulled myself back up because I started thinking, it's, you know, it's going to stop the parade. You know, you know we, we, we didn't want to stop everything, and it was going to hurt. And so I, I fought, pulled my, no, bed full of guys, none of them grabbed grab my hand and pulled me up. So I pulled myself back up. For the longest time, and, and why I still have this fear of falling, I think goes back to that because I don't remember having that fear before it. There are times where, uh, like at Pigeon Forge or Gatlinburg, they've got these chair lifts that go up the side of the mountains. Christine and I have been in those, and the first time I rode up, uh, you know what I wanted to do? Jump out. I had, I had this feeling of, I've either got to stay here or I'm going out. And it was the same feeling I had when I was in the back of that pickup truck. Either I'm going to stay here or I'm going out. Now, if I do it enough times, I don't think about that anymore. But there's still that sense and still that feeling that I have because it's something that I've been conditioned that every time I get up in a high place or climb up something I think the fastest way down is to jump and so I, I, I'm nervous about it it's that conditioning and something that you, you want to work on sometimes um, people have issues in their lives traumas, things they've experienced that make them jumpy that make them just nervous and afraid uh, of certain things. And like I said earlier, what do we do with that? Uh, you know why I'm afraid of mice? You don't know. Because when I was a teenager, we had a cabin we built back in the holler for, to hunt in, uh, when we went hunting. And we, the night before deer season, we go stay in that cabin, and it wasn't well insulated. And I was let, we had a couch in there, and I, I slept on that couch. I had a couple mice run across me in the middle of the night. I don't like mice. That's why I like dead mice, but I don't like live mice. And so there's that trauma that I experienced as a young man in the middle of the night, feeling these mice run across me, throwing off the blanket, hearing them fly across the room and hit the wall. So I tell you that, and then Sunday you're going to put a fake mouse up on the pulpit, right? You say, that, that's, what, that's, that's what we've got to avoid. Because we may think, well, you know, it's just kind of silly. But for me or for somebody else. What they've gone through is something that really bothers them. And so what we need to do is people who have been conditioned or experienced things or have been taught this fear, show a little grace and be, be kind uh, and know that they're not alone in this. Um, I'm going to bring up an issue because for the last two years it's really kind of been the elephant in the room in the coronavirus. There's some, and, and I think it falls under this category to some degree as well. For the last couple of years, uh, there's been a lot of fear about it. And I, one thing interesting about Facebook is that if you've not done this or, or seen this, or if you don't have Facebook, uh, good for you. Uh, but uh, if you've seen it, it, it reminds you of things that you posted on social media from years ago, whatever you posted on this day two years ago. And recently, all these videos that I did two years ago have been popping up. I've listened to a couple of them. I can hear the fear in my voice when I'm talking, well, especially when I'm talking about what's going on at that time. We didn't know what was happening at the time. 
We didn't know why we had to stay home. We didn't understand the impact of it. I didn't know very many people that were affected by it. I do now. I do know a lot of people. I know people that have died from it. I've had it, uh, it, it year when it first started. Uh, it, so, you know, at the beginning, there was that, that fear. And, and I understand because of health issues and because of complications that it, it causes, people are still concerned about it. And I liken it this way. Um, I have high blood pressure too. Do you think I'm afraid of high blood pressure because I take medicine? No. I'm afraid of the complications of high blood pressure, so I take the medicine. There are people who are still fearful of the coronavirus because of the complications of the coronavirus. So you wear a mask, you get a shot. Wonderful. But our society has taken it to the fact where, well, you're just afraid. No. You know, we don't do that with anybody else, with anybody else's diseases. Uh, 116 million people, almost half the American population, has high blood pressure. 81 million people have had COVID. But yeah, we tell them you're too afraid and you need to get over things. Uh, I don't think that's the proper attitude to have. Um, sometimes we are conditioned, though, to worry about things when we ought not worry about them. And I think there, there are probably some people who are still worried about it and have no reason to be. They've had it. They've had it twice. They've had all their shots. And really, um, good shape, good health, not much to worry about. Some people do have that fear, and, and we don't mock that. We don't make fun of that. We, we try to show a little kindness and a little compassion during those times because you can be taught to be afraid of something that you've never experienced. Anybody here afraid of sharks? Anybody been in a shark attack? But we're afraid of sharks. Why? Because sharks are mean. And I remember when SeaWorld, Cleveland used to have a SeaWorld, believe it or not. And I remember we went there and they opened up the shark encounter and you got to walk through the tunnel with all the sharks. They showed a video on a large screen of all these shark attacks attacking people and boats. And I didn't want to, I was 30 years old, I didn't want to walk through that thing. I'd never been around a shark, but I was afraid of them. And so there is the possibility for us to be watching things and hearing things where we become afraid of things that we don't even know anything about. And so we can be taught that. And so in the, we've got to understand where people are coming from and why they may be afraid. They may not know why they're afraid. And maybe we can talk to them a little bit and help them through some of that. Uh, maybe the situation that we're in, public speaking, uh, is maybe why we're... We're, we have an instance where we have to get up and speak, and we don't speak very often in a public setting. So, so we experience that fear. We have a doctor's appointment, and so we don't know what to expect. And really, that's what it is, the fear of the unknown. We don't know what's going to happen. And, and so the situation we're in, we don't know what's going to happen. I have, this is, this is silly. I shouldn't say that. Every fear is important. But I have a, a fear of making phone calls to people I don't know. Hannah has the same fear. We don't like calling people we've never called before. And so uh, I thought I was doing a wonderful thing, getting Christina to call all these people that I'd never called before. I said, hey, it, get you out there a little bit. I came to realize it was just something I was afraid of because we don't know what to expect. And we don't know what's going to be said. And we don't know how these instances are going to take place. When the disciples saw Jesus walking on water, what were they afraid of? Because they'd never seen this before. They weren't afraid till they see him coming. And, and of course, uh, in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them. Uh, he said, they said, it's a ghost. He spoke to them, said, take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. We don't know what's going on in the situation. We don't know how to interpret the event and what's happening. The one way to get through it is to focus on what you know is true and let the event play itself out. And so... You know that you, if you've got to get up and make a, a, a speech, if you've got to go to the doctor, if you've got to make a phone call, if whatever it is you've got to do, in that situation, here's what I know I can control. And the situation will play itself out. And so we may be in the situation we become afraid. There are those who just choose to be afraid. And um, I, I say this in a, in a way that there, there's something to this. It's not that... I don't understand why anybody would choose to, but uh, let, me, let me give this illustration. Anybody like horror movies? Gabe? <laughs> like horror? Yeah. Uh, I don't. And uh, one of the reasons being 
is, um, Dave, you help him. One of the, the reasons being is that I just don't like to be, be scared. I don't like to be shocked at, at some of these things. Some people like that, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, there's nothing wrong with anybody liking movies. Uh, I, I remember um, some of the scariest movies were Jaws. You watch it now, and you're like, it's a fake shark. But I'm still afraid of sharks, right? Uh, so we may choose to be afraid. And one of the things about it is, um, and I say this because two people could be in the same situation, and one's afraid and one's not. And so it may be a choice uh, to be afraid. There's something to it. Uh, neurologically, dopamine's released in the brain when you become scared. And, you know, if, if you've ever been in a haunted house and you've gone around the corner and someone jumped out at you and you screamed, and then what'd you do? You laughed. Because it, it, there's that release of this, this uh, dopamine and it, it, it's pleasing for, for a moment. Uh, there's also that gratification of, of saying, well, I did it. I was able to get through this. I was able to watch this or be a part of this. So uh, those things, but then there are people who just choose to live their life in fear. And it, it, I don't know if it is because they get some sort of feeling from it or some sort of uh, emotional boost from it, but there are people who will choose to live their life in fear. All right, do you have any questions or any comments before we... Am I way off the mark? No? Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, you, you know what you can control, you know what you can say, uh, you know what you can do, and you've got to let the situation play itself out. Uh, so there's always, there's, there's always something that we worry about. And, and a lot of this, you notice a lot of these things win or lap. Uh, fear, worry, anxiety, um, grief, depression. Uh, we'll talk about that next week. They all kind of tie together in one way or another at times. Ed? Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, I, I've I've been around long enough to to feel that. I'm worried about it. Um, I mean, Russia went to war. I, I know this world is not my home. I'm just passing through, but I really don't want to live under a nuclear cloud. And so I'm. I, that, I was afraid of that. Um, one of the things that, by the way, uh, as a side note, the uh, Supreme Court issue that happened a couple days ago with Roe versus Wade, Sunday night I'm going to talk about abortion in the Bible uh, because, and, and what this all could mean. But things like that, you hear, because what are we being taught? If this changes, the world's going to end. And so there's a fear of what can happen in the next two months. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, I I want to go quiet and peacefully in my sleep like my grandfather did, and not like the passengers in the car he was driving. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Quiet and peacefully in my sleep like my grandfather, not like the passengers in the car he was driving. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that's a bad joke at the wrong time. I know it. No, I understand. I understand because I, I think about that too. Uh, and, and, and what is fascinating to me is I'm not afraid of where I'm going. I'm not afraid of what's going to happen. I'm not a fear, afraid of God. I'm not afraid of the judgment because I know I'm doing what I need to be doing. But what I'm afraid of is what's going to happen to Christina, what's going to happen to the kids, what's going to happen to the people that are behind. That's my fear. And so we do have that. I, I do understand that. And, and, you know, again, what can we do afterwards? What can I do about everybody that's still alive after I die? Nothing. And, and so 
you know, I, I, I can prepare for it. I can prepare them for it, uh, but there's not much we can do. Speaking of my grandfather, after he did pass away uh, almost a little over 20 years ago, uh, my grandmother told my aunts and my uncles, you need to go out and visit him or he'll be mad at you. And, and that's not a good way to, to talk to people and say, you need to go out and visit the grave or he's going to be mad at you because now you're afraid that if I don't go out there enough, he's going to be mad at me. The dead don't know what's going on. Ecclesiastes tells us that. So uh, I've got to deal with what I can deal with, what I can handle, the situation I will be in, and um, prepare for the rest, I guess. So how do we overcome some of this? Uh, sometimes we just lose confidence in ourselves. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 21, verse 21 and 22, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree and even to say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. Whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. I'm not telling you, you just need to have more faith to overcome fear. But sometimes we do um, lose confidence in the things that we can do. We lose confidence in ourselves. We lose confidence in the situation. And so it makes us afraid. Can I talk on the phone? Yes, I've called many of you on the phone, right? I'd rather text you. But can I talk on the phone? Yes, it's something I can do. But I lose that confidence when I've got to call somebody I've not known before. Can I get up on the roof and clean all the gumballs off the roof? Yes, I can. But I lose the confidence in myself trying to get back down. And so there are times where we, we just, in the sense, we, we lose that, that confidence. If we become fearful of something, whatever the situation is, it's always ha handy to do some research on the subject. Um, it's always good to uh, figure out what the situation is, what to expect, uh, what to, uh, what's going to happen. I'm going to give you a couple of things. This comes from the Mayo Clinic and their discussion. They had, there's a long dissertation paper about fear and how to overcome fear. But there were four things that they had that I got out of it that I thought were beneficial uh, to overcome fear. Acknowledge and learn from your fear. Uh, they said everyone encounters fear inducing situations. Even if you don't act how you'd hope in the moment, reflecting on what you found in the situation to be so overwhelming can help you be better equipped to deal with the situation in the ne next time. And I'd, I, I would agree with that. Um, going up the side of a mountain on a ski lift. The first time I wanted to jump out, held Christina's hand. Uh, first time we flew in a plane together, I about broke her fingers holding it on the takeoff and on the landing. Uh, now I you know, look out the window and watch us go up and watch us come down because I've learned from it. I, this, is, this is going to be okay. Um, you know, do you have a fear of flying? Well, you might. Uh, I did for a long time, like I said, and then I did some research on it, and I found out pilots don't like to crash either. And so <laughs> once I thought, well, you know what? Pilots don't want to crash either, so they're going to do everything they can to keep the plane in the air. So maybe I'll be okay. And so I acknowledge what I'm afraid of. I learn from that fear, and it helps me deal with the situation next time. I know what to expect. I know what's going to take place. And next time I go up the side of the hill in a uh, ski lift, I'm happy and I'm enjoying it. And I'm looking for bears and uh, everything's good. Understand that fear can be positive. They said fear can be a sign that you're doing things that are out of your comfort zone. Understanding that fear can be a sign that you're challenging yourself can help you push through and find strength. And so it can be in a positive sense uh, that you're maturing or you're growing in some form or fashion. Grow to meet the challenges. If something in your daily life is causing you fear, it might be a signal to seek self-betterment. Think about what you can do to meet the challenges causing fear so that you're better prepared to meet them. Uh, maybe it's time to try something different. Maybe uh, it's trying to meet the challenge that you, you were afraid of uh, for so long. And it may, you may be a better person because of it. And so I thought that was an interesting point. And then it's, uh, they also said overcoming fear is hard, but it's, uh, it's an automatic process. It can make you freeze and leave your feeling drained. But if you push through, you, you reflect on how you were brave and able to get through it. And it gains pride. Uh, I was able to get down from the ladder. I was able to pick up the live mouse, which I still won't do. Uh, that I'm able to do these things uh, to overcome some fear that I may have in my life. So there's, there's a sense of accomplishment as well. 
uh, and a sense of pride in overcoming these fears. Next week, uh, I said it was depression. I guess it's anger. Don't be angry at me. Uh, I guess it's anger. Because, again, this is uh, one of those issues. And when I asked the question, was Jesus ever angry? That's a whole lot easier to answer. Oh, he was, and how he dealt with it. And sometimes anger can be um, a part of our lives, and we don't know why or what's the cause of it, and it just hurts us and hurts others around us. So uh, we'll deal with the subject of anger, how to proper, properly um, express that anger, and uh, things of that nature. Are there any other comments or questions before we uh, start to wrap up tonight? Anybody want to admit what they're afraid of? You should be. <laughs> I am now. <laughs> no. No. It, there's, I, and that's where, you know, we start off with phobias, and I, you know, that, that's a little bit different than some things we talked about. Fear that can cripple us. And um, it's just, I don't, I don't have mice all around my house every day. I, I don't climb a ladder every day. So there are things you can avoid that if you're afraid of that you don't have to do. Um, phobias in that nature. One of the things that's the hardest, and I, I knew a boy that was afraid of water. Baptizing him took about an hour. And, and, that, and that was very early on when I first started preaching. Maybe within the first week or two, uh, a sister, uh, his sister wanted to be baptized, and, and uh, a day or two later he wanted to be baptized. But he was so scared of water, uh, so frightfully afraid of it. And, and we were in the baptistry. Thankfully, it was heated, but we were in the baptistry for an hour. And it, see, you know, when you baptize people, you got to lay them down, right? So every time I start to lay him down, his feet would kick out, his arms would go out. He, he just would not go underneath the water. And so you, you, you think, well, he just needs to quit being afraid and just do. No, I came, uh, I realized at that moment, I, this, he, he can't handle this. And instead of chastising him or just saying, okay, here we go, <clears throat> and doing that, we got a chair, and I put him in the chair, and it was up to his chest, and I said, okay, we'll, we'll count to three and just lean forward. One, two, three, and up he came. I'll see him in heaven someday. You know, you can deal with your fears. Uh, you can help people overcome their fears. There's a way around a lot of these different things, but um, you know, fear of water, uh, that was... That was an experience for me. I never, never thought anybody would be afraid to, to be baptized, but he was. So um, a, lot of, a lot of ways to, to reassure people, help people with their fears rather than just say, get over it and quit being so afraid. All right, let's bow for a word of prayer because we're about done for tonight. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your love and your mercy that you've shown us. We, we pray, Father, as we go through this life, as we strive to serve you each day, that you'll give us... Uh, a spirit of courage to proclaim your word that we may be able to overcome the fears uh, that we have and and be better servants of yours in in many instances we pray father that you would help us through these things let's help one another as we go through them as well we ask you to watch over us as we leave this place and keep us safe it's in jesus name we pray amen